In this video, we're going to be going over my favorite subject, which is the universal quantum computer. Now, this notion was introduced in 1985 by David Deutsch, the same guy responsible for Deutsch's algorithm. And what's fascinating about this notion is that Deutsch argues that quantum computing allows us to consider the output of Turing machines not just as marks on a piece of paper, but as actual physical states of reality. And what this does is it increases our conception of what we can produce with a computer. In fact, a universal Turing machine would mean we could output any possible physical state of reality, including ones that aren't found naturally in the universe. So this is a, a very interesting conception. And to get a better idea of it, what we're going to do is we're going to first talk about Turing machines and then the universal Turing machine, and then we're going to show how that connects to quantum computing by the end. But first things first, what is a Turing machine? So it's a hypothetical device proposed by Alan Turing in 1937, and its basic construct is pretty simple. We have a, a blank tape of zeros and ones that go off into infinite directions in, in each direction. So we have an hypothetically an infinite amount of memory of computing space, but all the numbers have to be finite in order for us to compute them. What we also have is a set of states which tell us what to do when a scanner reads a certain symbol. So here's a very simple implementation of, of a Turing machine that's solving the equation x plus 1 where x is equal to 4. So we have our Turing machine here. It goes off with an infinite amount of zeros in all these directions, and it has a block of four ones, which represent 4 in this case. And it has a, a state, which it's looking in, in which case it's looking at this block. Now, what these states do is they tell us to scan the current symbol we're on and read either a 1 or a 0. And depending on what we do, we can do one of four things. Either we can print a 0, we can erase the square and print a 0, we can erase the square and print a 1, we can move to the right, or we can move to the left. With just these very simple operations, we are able to calculate a whole number of things, which we'll see shortly. But for this example, you can see here we start in state 0, scanning the symbol number 1. What this tells us to do is if we read a 1, go to the right, we can, and go back to state 0. So we loop back. As you'll see, the start state will read a 1, it'll move to the right, it'll read a 1, it'll move to the right, it'll read a 1, it'll move to the right, continuing to loop. But once it reads a 0, it'll print that 0. Once it reads this symbol, it'll print that 0 into a 1. And then it'll loop backwards, it'll continue along these 1s until it reaches a 0, and then it'll move into the final state. So where our tape started with just 4 1s, we now have a tape with 5 1s. And as you can see, 4 plus 1 equals 5, so we get the, the correct answer. And we can build Turing machines to solve a whole number of problems. Here's one for solving x plus y. Uh, I'll leave it to you to pause the video and, and figure out why it works. But here, since x is 2 and y is 3, our final state will be a block of 5 1s. And this Turing machine here shows how to, to calculate that. So not only can we construct Turing machines to solve x plus 1 and x plus y, but we can use them to solve a great variety of problems x squared, x squared plus y squared, division, uh, x to the 4 plus y to the 2 plus z to the 17. It goes on and on. And what the, the Church-Turing thesis states is that any function that can be computed can be computed by a Turing machine. So you can solve any question that can possibly be solved by one of these Turing machines. So another interesting thing that Alan Turing discovered was that you, in fact, can encode each Turing machine 
so that it ha each has its own unique number. You do that by rewriting the variables in a table, then representing each of the four variables in a four tuple, like this. And what this equation is, is for x plus 1, which we looked at earlier. And just, just to remind you, here's what the state diagram looks like. And when we draw that in the table, this is, this is what we get. Now, we can encode these tuples in binary by using an interesting technique. So we have a block of four ones, each separated by a zero. And each of the, the block of ones represents one of these four states. So here, the start state for zero and one, because we can't represent zero with zero, because we're using the zeros to separate the blocks, we represent state zero by one one and state one with two ones right here. Our next block of ones represent the current symbol that we're reading. Once again, one for zero and two ones to represent one. The third block of ones is the new state it goes into, and the fourth block of ones is the action that it takes. These are print a one, print a zero, go to the left, go to the right. And we can encode each of those four possibilities with a block of ones. So here we have four ones represents go to the right, two ones here represents print a one, and, and so on. So now what we can do is we can actually then encode each of these tuples into a unique number by separating each tuple by two zeros to distinguish them from themselves. So we get this unique binary number, which eventually we'll write as an integer, but we can also then represent the input value by separating it with a block of three zeros and then the input value for x that we want. In this case, it's four. So here we have a unique number for solving x plus one where x is equal to four. And we can rewrite it to calculate when x equals six or when x equals 10, or we can rewrite a unique number for x plus y or anything. And if we write this binary number now, as a unique number, you see that we have this unique number for this particular function, and we'll have another unique number for any other function that we want. So now, before I explain the universal Turing machine, I'm just going to go over countable numbers really quickly, because they help us to get a bit of a better idea of exactly what's going on with the universal Turing machine. So a set is countable if there exists an injective function f from s to the natural numbers. So there's a mapping of the natural numbers to the elements in set s, whether the set is y or z, there's a mapping function. And you can quite literally think of this function as a Turing machine, where you input a natural number into the Turing machine and it outputs the values that you're looking for in a calculation. Now, there's another set of numbers called countably infinite numbers, where if there's a surjective function from s to the natural numbers, then it's said to be infinite. So basically, if a set takes an infinite amount of numbers to count it, then that set is infinite. So the interesting thing now is that because we have a way of encoding each Turing machine with a unique number, we now are able to represent it as a countably infinite set and have a function that maps natural numbers to the Turing machines. And because that function is also a Turing machine, we have a single Turing machine called the universal Turing machine that can simulate any other Turing machine possible. So all you have to do is input its unique number, input the unique number for the machine and the x value you're looking for, and it'll output the same result as if you were to just run that single Turing machine. So for instance, if we were to put the unique number for x plus 1 where x equals 4 that we looked at earlier, it's going to output 5, the correct answer. And we can input, in fact, any possible Turing machine, or just about every possible Turing machine, into this universal Turing machine, 
and it'll give us the result that we're looking for, which is very useful because now we don't have to build an entirely new machine every time we want to do a calculation. We can just have a machine like your phone or your desktop computer where all you have to do is build it once and then it'll calculate every possible equation that it's able to compute. Now, one limitation of the universal Turing machine, which Turing talked about, is the fact that there's some machines that it, or some equations that it cannot calculate. So we can think of this as uncountable numbers. So the irrational numbers are uncountable. This is Candor's diagonal proof where he, he showed that some numbers are uncountable. So what that means is that while we're able to represent any Turing machine on the universal, on the universal Turing machine, we cannot compute all of them. So the set of all Turing machines is countable, but the set of all Turing machines and their input values is not countable. And some examples of these machines are the halting machine, which is the, the most famous machine that Turing talked about or showed couldn't exist in his paper. So the ones like the busy beaver function and, and other ones that Turing machines can't calculate. But the important thing is that it can calculate every other algorithm or every other possible function. And there just happen to be an infinite amount of them. Like all the ones you see online and the encodings into to AI robots and, and all of these different functions can be encoded into this Turing machine and it'll output the, the correct answer, which really is an incredible thought. So now let's start thinking about the universal quantum computer. So the Church-Turing hypothesis, as I mentioned before, is that every function which would naturally be regarded as computable can be computed by the universal Turing machine. Now in his 1985 paper, uh, David Deutsch, sort of upon realizing or coming up with the conception of quantum computers, realized that a better definition would be that every finitely re realizable physical system can be perfectly simulated by a universal model computing machine. So what this is saying is when we consider the connection or the fact that when we're making these calculations, we're using the, the bits, the photons and particles of the universe itself to make its computation, it tells us about you know, the structure of, of reality. And because we can simulate any classical computer and any quantum computer on a, a quantum Turing machine, because we have things like universal gates here, and this is a, a Tolfi gate, which is a universal quantum gate, it goes to show that we can indeed construct quantum computers that can simulate any other machine, just like the universal Turing machine can. And here, here's the representation of the universal quantum computer, very similar to the universal Turing machine. The input states are just a little bit different. They're eigenvalues instead of just normal one or zero bits. So our quantum computer has a number of interesting properties that classical computers don't. So one of them is generating truly random numbers. Classical computers, you know, they have things like random number generators. These aren't truly random and rely on some sort of algorithm to produce their outputs. Quantum computers, on the other hand, because you aren't sure what the observable is before you actually look at it, they can produce truly random numbers, which is different than classical computers. Another very interesting property about quantum computers is that they can simulate any finite physical system in the universe, which is incredible because it means, as David Deutsch points out, that there are some systems that, we, that don't exist in nature, but that we can simulate with the universal quantum computer. So for instance, he talks about how one scientist pointed out that the surface of the black hole can be represented 
by a finite number, which means that we can simulate that with our quantum computer, which is an extraordinary thought. What else can we produce with a universal quantum computer? Maybe perhaps water that boils at a thousand degrees and freezes at negative a thousand? Could we perhaps reproduce the conditions that created the Big Bang? I don't know, these are interesting questions that we haven't fully figured out yet. And one more interesting thing is when we begin to realize that it's the universe doing computational steps to produce its calculation with the universal quantum computer, it really tells us something just about how the universe is structured and perhaps why the physical laws that we have in the universe exist in the way that they do. So, for instance, Deutsch has an example of an experiment that you could reproduce with a quantum computer that looks like this. And this, Deutsch explains, is an implementation of the einstein polsky rosen experiment. If we consider experiments to be a bit more general than just tests done in a lab somewhere by scientists, but rather the decisions that you make on an everyday basis, you begin to see the underlying structure, the logical structure between quantum computers, the laws of the universe, and the decisions that you make. So for instance, say you have a particular career that you're interested in, you perform a series of logical steps in order to achieve that outcome. You know, you maybe go to school, work really hard, you build a cool quantum website, or whatever you do, you are performing this algorithm to hopefully produce the outcome that you want. But also, remember with quantum, you can't know for certain that that outcome is going to happen. There's these unknown probabilities that you can't be sure of before you measure. So you have both. You have a, a structure of the world that you can perform to produce outcomes that occur, sometimes with high probability, but you can never be 100% sure of that. So I hope this just goes to show you that quantum computing and the logic of computer science and the physical laws of the universe are all very interconnected, and they can have a profound effect on just how you perform your everyday decisions, how you, how you think about them, and also just how you think about the universe and perhaps why it's structured the way that it is. So that's my video tutorial series. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're excited for the developments of quantum computing in the next few years. Not only for the practical applications that it can have in the world, but also for our understanding of our place in it.